Today is Veterans Day 1995. The reason that I put this in the record is today, according to my rain gauge, in the last 24 hours, we received one inch of rain. And one inch of rain is important when you're going to talk about the hydraulics of Chautauqua Lake. And Chautauqua Lake is a hydraulic system. I've got an awful lot of information that I want to share to you in this very small half hour. Generally speaking, Chautauqua Lake watershed, 180.5 square miles, receives on average 42 inches of rain a year. I shouldn't call it rain, I should call it precipitation because it comes as snow, sleet, mist, and drizzle. But basically we get 42 inches of water. Now, I'm going to go through a mathematical game with you because it's important for you to understand what 42 inches of water means. When you get through with the mathematics of looking at an acre of land, which is 42,360 square feet, and you, you begin to understand what an inch of rain means on that, and when you look at the total watershed of 180.5 square miles, what you're talking about in annual precipitation is 1 trillion 99 billion pounds of water. And the reason I give it to you as pounds is because I want you to understand the magnitude of the energy that is involved as that falls on the watershed and as that reacts within the watershed. The, we've all been taught about the hydrological cycle, but I think that we've got to review it just a little bit again to understand the lake as a hydrological cycle. And the reason that I want you to understand the lake is a hydrological cycle, it'll help you understand some of the manifestations of the lake that we like immensely and other th things that we don't like so much. And realize that it is a product of the hydrological cycle to a certain degree. Uh, off on the bulletin board over here, I have a, an imagery of a hydrological cycle as uh, idealized, and I'd like to look at that for a moment and uh, have us uh, understand what is taking place. So over here is an idealized picture. You get your annual precipitation onto the ground, and it either runs off and runs into the lake or percolates down through the soil, or the vegetation of the area on which the precipitation falls is going to catch it and hold it. And so there are several things that we've got to look at when we look at that 42 inches of annual precipitation. Part of it is intercepted by everything that is growing in the watershed. And part of it is intercepted by just the surfaces it lands on. And so somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of the annual precipitation immediately returns to the atmosphere either as transpiration or evaporation within the watershed. The remainder of it comes as runoff or percolates down into the ground. About 5 to 15 percent of that precipitation is going to go into the groundwater system, but it will eventually flow out into the uh, Chautauqua Lake. Keep that in the back of your mind. I realize you probably saw it in the fifth, sixth, or seventh grade, but it's important in order to understand the lake itself. Depending upon the time of year that the annual precipitation falls, you get different types of manifestations. And we're going to look at that in detail in a moment. But there are some things, again, to put in the back of your mind. If we get a snowstorm, depending upon the size of the snow particle, uh, how cold it is, we could get, in one inch of precipitation, we could get as much as 10 inches, or under some very extreme conditions, maybe 15 to 20 inches of snow, but only get one inch of moisture. Nominally, they figure a foot of snow may equalize an inch of precipitation. Over the years, uh, I have done snow measurements, 
In some instances, such as 1976, the reason for the snow measurement was to alert the people that we were going to have a spring flood. That particular uh, fall, winter, and spring, we ended up in February with between five and six inches of water in the snowpack, even though the snowpack up above Mayville was 43 inches deep and the snowpack down along the Maple uh, Golf Course, Maple Hills Golf Course, uh, was only six inches deep. However, that six inches of snow was almost solid water. Uh, and it was just waiting to melt. And we've got to understand that that plays a role in, in what happens. And historically, it plays a role because it gives us our spring freshet that allowed the early uh, transportation of goods and services out of the Chautauqua Lake watershed. The watershed of 180.5 square miles catches this precipitation and then transports, depending upon what numbers game you'd like to use, anywhere from 45 to 65 percent of it to the lake. Realize as these billions of pounds of water move down across the watershed, they dissolve chemicals, they help rot vegetation, and they carry materials and chemistry of the watershed into the lake. And it must be remembered that these are not necessarily man-made phenomena. They're part of the natural system. And therefore, Chautauqua Lake is a very rich lake. How rich? Well, if we look at the Great Lakes Basin, every surface acre of the Great Lakes has somewhere between two and three and a half acres of watershed for every surface acre of the lake. Where in Chautauqua Lake, for every 7.8 acres of watershed, we have an acre of surface area. Therefore, we have an even greater opportunity for just the natural hydrological system to carry nutrient loading to Chautauqua Lake. That's not to excuse man for some of the things that he's done in the watershed, but for you to understand how important the hydrological system is to the manifestation that you find in the watershed. The other things that we should understand is that while the upper lake basin and the lower lake basin are split 52 to 48 percent in terms of the surface area of the lake, the upper lake holds 72 percent of the water of the lake. Only 28 percent of it is in the lower half of the lake. Also to be remembered is the fact that the upper lake has a, and this is, this is a, a twirl, it has a, a mean depth of 26 feet, an average depth of 35 feet, while the lower lake has a mean depth of 11 feet and a maximum depth of only 20 feet, whereas the upper lake has a maximum depth of about 77 feet. There are some maps that show greater depths, but I can tell you that in the work that, that we have done on the lake over the years, uh, we have not been able to find the 90-foot depth that was recorded on one of the maps that's still displayed on some of the walls of Chautauqua County. By the way, this presentation is based upon a series of documents, and I should give credit to them. We start out with the Corps of Engineers report in the early 1940s, then their early 1950s report, Interestingly enough, in the early 1940s, the Corps of Engineers said the best way to prevent flooding around the shores of Chautauqua Lake was to not build in the normal floodplain. Hmm, how logical can you get? Uh, by 1952, we'd had enough people build in the normal floodplain that they were calling for relief uh, from the floods, and the Corps of Engineers created a wonderful uh, proposal where they were going to take the surplus water and drain them up through the Continental Divide and into Little Chautauqua Creek and down into Lake Erie. Someday, if you want to get involved in that, we can spend a whole, a whole half hour on the 1952 Corps of Engineers proposal. We also have the Harvey Report, which was done by an engineer by the name of Harvey from Nussbaumer, Clark, and Velzey for the state of New York, dealing with whether or not there should be any further dredging in the lake. Um, we also have the Allegheny River Basin Report of 1972, which gave us a lake management scheme and a, man a manner in which to operate Warner Dam 
uh, to the advantage of, of reducing flooding and maintaining the best possible summer lake elevation for recreation purposes. We then also have the benchmark studies, which was a series of studies financed uh, or encouraged by the uh, Chautauqua County government, particularly Joseph Jirasi, the county executive at that time, and then the 1989, 88, and 89 study dealing with the aquatic vegetation of Chautauqua Lake. Things that we have to be understanding about is, is the whole complexity of, of the watershed. And while I have mentioned depths and dimensions and capacities of various parts of the watershed, I'm going to repeat them because I think it's important that you have them in mind. 72% of the water of Chautauqua Lake is in the upper lake, 28% in the lower lake. The maximum depth of the lower lake is 20 feet. The other parts of the lake, uh, maximum depth is 70 to 75 feet, depending upon whose dimensions do you use. Uh, the reason I repeat those things is that when we begin to look at the lake as a biological system, those are going to be important to remember. Maximum depth of 20 feet in the lower lake, average depth of 11 feet. Um, we'll get into that in, in greater detail. The other thing that we need to know about and need to understand is how the waters of the lake flow out of the lake. We have never done any real measuring of current because I don't know that we can perceive that. But I would like to take you to a, a chart on the back of the wall and, and look at the Shattuckoin River as it courses uh, through the city of Jamestown. And in that, we will be able to understand something about why the lake flows in the manner that it does. So if we can move back to that now. And I'm doing this Chinese, as somebody has su suggested. But what I'm doing is I'm going from east to west uh, through the Shattuckoin River. The Shattuckoin River runs for a total of 36,000 feet uh, through the city of Jamestown. And it starts about seven, the outlet per se starts about 7,000 feet uh, east of Dunham Avenue and Celeron. This line is the bottom of the river. And you'll notice that it's flat. And then all of a sudden, it, it rises a bit and then flats out again. And if you can catch this yellow line, that yellow line is an elevation of 1,300 feet above mean sea level. This line up here is 1,308 feet above mean sea level and 1,310 feet above mean sea level. So this gives you an idea as you go down the Shattuckoin River and begin to approach the Third Street Bridge that the bottom of the Shattuckoin is coming up. And what we have here is the manifestation that I mentioned in an earlier segment of shale bottom at an elevation which is 1,302.5 feet above mean sea level. Then we come down to the sill of Warner Dam, and the Shattuckoin River then proceeds to flow downhill some 50 plus feet to the corporate limit at Dow Street. It's important that you understand that this exists because this is the throat that controls how waters flow out of Chautauqua Lake. Unless you understand this, you won't understand the frustrations that we will talk about later when we talk about flooding. The channel gets shallower and shallower. And historically, I would tell you that the channel also gets narrower and narrower until you travel down uh, on Foot Avenue and by the hospital and uh, go across the river and you realize that it flows under a building and it's only about 20 feet wide. Uh, many years ago I had, when Bill Parmet worked with me, I had him do a study of what the Holland Land Company felt the Shattuckoin River looked like when they did the uh, survey back at the turn of the century. And we estimate that the width of the Shattuckoin today, or the valley that it's allowed to, to move in, is somewhere between a quarter and a third of what it originally was uh, before a European man started channeling the river. When we get involved with the annual precipitation, we have to look at how it falls, and when it falls, and with what intensity it falls. 
And I have another illustration behind me that will help us understand that. And if I can move up to that illustration now. This illustration is a water year. Uh, for some reason, hydrologists use something other than a calendar year. So at the beginning here is the 1st of October, and at the other end is the last day of September. And what we have in the top row is the daily precipitation. The next two lines uh, deal with high and low temperatures during the winter months. Then we come down to the elevation of the lake as normal and cast upon it. In green, we have the flow going out of the Shattercoin River. And in red, we have the lake elevation as it was taken on a daily basis. And then down below in blue, we have the snowpack that exists in the watershed. You will note that we get a very flat lake elevation and, relatively speaking, a flat flow line in the lake. Realize that in most years, sometime in April, the Shattercoin River Warner Dam is closed except when we have peak happenings or rainstorms. And this is necessary in order to maintain the summer lake elevation. In the early 1970s, with the Allegheny River Basin Board, we went into a planning program to look at Chautauqua Lake. And based on the recommendations that were made by previous Corps of Engineers reports, they said that there should be a lake management scheme there is some way in which we must be responsive to what is happening and that we can lower the incidence of flooding and maybe keep the lake elevation up so that it's of more use to us. So that is what has happened. And what you find here, this happens to be the water year of 1977, the first year that we put in place the recommendations by the Allegheny River Basin Board as to how we should manage uh, the water level of Chautauqua Lake to get the best advantage in terms of flood protection and the best uh, protection in terms of uh, having a recreational lake level. There's one other thing that should be understood, and that is what the restriction that I showed you a few minutes earlier means to us. And on another chart uh, over on the easel, I have some dates and some elevations. And I would like to take you to those dates and those elevations so that you can see how long it takes to draw one foot of elevation off of Chautauqua Lake. So if we can now scan over to the easel over here. In 1981, 1980, we had a public meeting on the operation of the dam and what we were doing. And one of the things that was displayed was this set of information. And this is the record of lake drawdown with maximum outflows. Maximum outflows are when the gates of Warner Dam are not restricting flow at all. With a lake elevation at 1310 and no precipitation, we can draw the lake down one foot in six days. In uh, 1978, with eight tenths of an inch of precipitation and three days with a temperature above 32 and the lake elevation at 1307, it took us 35 days to draw a foot of elevation off of the lake. So that gives you an idea of the restrictive character that the channel gives us. And that's why I included the weather as it happened during that particular time. Once you understand that, you understand why the lake program suggests that we begin to draw the water elevation on the lake down sometime in November and attempt to draw it down continually. And as the water elevation drops, the ability to lower the lake elevation diminishes. It's a very important factor to keep in the back of your mind. I now would like to go back over to the other chart uh, and run through some of the things that it illustrates for the year of 1977. One of the problems that we have when we use this table 
is that the flow information is registered at Dow Street, which means that it's all the way at the eastern line of the city of Jamestown. And therefore, we get 10 square miles of urban runoff in our figures that are the city of Jamestown. But let's look at this. We start here in October, all right? And we go through to this point where we have this very high peak which is March 20th. And if you look back, you see what happened. We had a snowpack that disappeared and flowed into the river, brought the, the river flow up, and also brought the lake flow up. And time after time, we can find the correlation between this particular curve and the elevation of the lake. And again, to substantiate the numbers that I just gave you a few minutes ago. When we get to the summer months, uh, this is five, so this is May. This is the beginning of May. And we carry through here while we have a couple of rain episodes. Um, this carries you on through September. You can see that the flow down the Shattuckoin River is restricted until you get these sharp peaks. But if you look up all the way at the top, you see that this particular day, we had two and nine tenths inches of rain. So you get a combination of the water coming in onto the lake as well as the urban runoff. But notice what happens to the lake elevation. Even though you get those gigantic uh, that amount of rain and several days later you get three inches of rain, you don't get a dynamic increase in the elevation of the lake until you get into the uh, latter part of September. The vegetation during this time of year is absorbing and transpiring or creating enough surface space so that you get evaporation and we're not getting that water uh, to the lake. And that's typical of what happens during this time of year. This time of year we keep the dam closed or keep it flowing as little as possible in order to maintain the lake elevation. So what happens is when we look at the lower half of the lake with a maximum depth of 20 feet, an average depth of 11 feet, what we have is a very, very shallow pond. And this very shallow pond, uh, it's terrible to call it a pond, it's a beautiful lake, but this very shallow body of water is now penetrated by almost all of the light that is visible. And that has a very important implication uh, when we look at the rooted aquatics later on uh, in another presentation. I would like to sit back down again so I can wrestle with some of the material that's on my table here. Another thing that we ought to be interested in, and it comes from the Corps of Engineers report of the early 1950s, is the maximum possible storm that we could have on Chautauqua Lake. It would be a in, and in its watershed, it would be a summer type storm in which there would be 23.2 inches of rain falling in a 36 hour period. This means that Chautauqua Lake would raise, rise to an average of 1,319 feet. It would flow more than 6,000 cubic feet per second down the Shattercoin River. To give you an example of Maximum flow down the Shattercoin River at bank full, it flows 1,270 cubic feet per second. At that point, we begin to give people in the village of Faulkner fits about what's happening in the water levels in their basement. So these are things that we have to take into consideration as we look at, at what's going to take place or what we want the lake to take place, on the, what things we want to take place on the lake. When we deal with a lake that is that shallow, a lake that we basically restrict the outflow, the lower lake has a retention time, a hydraulic retention time of 105 days. The upper lake has a retention time of 526 days. Therefore, we can, if we are going to close the Warner Dam down in order to maintain the lake level, what we are doing is we are holding the water there in the lake. And as we get rainstorms and they carry chemistry into the lake, let's forget that there are human beings in the watershed at all for this model of thinking. We're going to continue to bring chemistry into the lake. 
bringing this chemistry into the lake is going to give us a richer lake. So without man in the watershed, we can look at the lower half of the lake and say that it is always going to be nutrient rich. And that again will get us into the biological uh, system of the lake and we'll leave that for another time. Uh, the other thing to be understood is that we very infrequently get a storm of any consequence that affects the whole lake and its watershed in the same manner. We've had storms that have flooded out uh, the Chautauqua Mall and has been bone dry in Mayville. I've had an instance where I had a two inch rainfall that I measured at my gauge in Mayville and down in, in uh, the city of Jamestown they measured no rain at all. Several years ago, if you remember, Prendergast Creek overflowed its banks and scared everybody out of a, one of the local bistros uh, and moved a couple of house or uh, travel trailers along the Prendergast. Uh, Goose Creek has risen up and smote the people along its banks and nothing has happened in the rest of the watershed. So you have that that takes place. We don't necessarily have two inches of rain all over the watershed at one time. We did once that I know of. That was Tropical Storm Frederick in 1979. Uh, Wanda Gustafson, who's in charge of emergency preparedness, and I sat down and looked at the weather report and the Pittsburgh Corps of Engineers said, you're gonna get three inches of rain. And I looked at uh, our records and I said to Wanda, hey, three inches of rain's not going to be any problem at all, Wanda, we can go home and sleep. Well, that night at 10.30, Tropical Storm Frederick came up through Chautauqua County. It's the only time we've had a tropical storm come through Chautauqua County. And it, each of the gauging stations in Chautauqua County measured anywhere between 5.8 inches of rain and 6.6 .6 inches of rain. And Chautauqua Lake rose to an elevation of 1310. Why is 1310 important? Because that is mathematically the elevation that we expect in a storm that has a 100-year frequency. And between the 100-year frequency storm and the 500-year frequency storm, there is only 1.1 foot of difference. So that the basin and the size of the lake itself acts as a big cushioning hydraulic system for us. But we shouldn't build in the normal floodplain of the lake. And it isn't until 1969 with the federal flood insurance that we finally get the building inspectors to, I shouldn't, shouldn't put it on the building inspectors. We finally get the local governments around the lake to pass ordinances to keep people from building in the normal floodplain of the lake. Before that, each year, the cost of flooding increased a little bit each time. And then, of course, in 1976, we introduced the new uh, lake management scheme, which, by the way, has been in place now since 1976. And I've asked several times that there be public hearings held on it and see if it's doing what we really want it to do and if not, that we should retune it a little bit. Realize that with the ma manner in which we are now handling the lake, we are sustaining uh, some shore erosion that historically we wouldn't see because it was not unusual in the summer months. I have family pictures from my wife's side of my family where the lake elevation in July could very well have been down at 1306 in July. Uh, I've seen places with uh, annual plants growing on them in family historic pictures that I have never seen dry. But historically they were dry uh, when the Chautauqua Lake was used basically as an industrial water pool and it was no longer used as a transportation resource. And there's where we stop at this point and our next presentation is going to be on Chautauqua Lake as a biological system and in order to appreciate the presentation on the biological system, you're going to have to remember some of the things that I've given you about the hydrological system. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of reference material out there. If you're interested, uh, consult the Chautauqua County Department of Planning for the information.